Our first reading today is from the book of Ecclesiastes. For everything there's a season, and a time for every matter unto heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, <clears throat> and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. Join me in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day to remember the fallen and those who serve. We ask your presence to watch over them today. Amen. I was in my garage about a week ago, working around, trying to absentmindedly sort out a few things, which my wife would like me to do more frequently. <laughs> and there in the corner under the rakes and the brooms and the snow shovels was my old friend, the Army's rucksack. It was dusty, a bit forlorn, simply empty, and it seemed a little more than dejected laying in the corner. I slapped off some of the dust and I started to the basement to take it and store it along with all the other uniforms and, and mementos and memories. And before I got to the door, I was overwhelmed with a wash of memories, mental pictures, sounds, scents, the things of a soldier's life, which has been my life. I sat there on a little bench for a while with the old rucksack and I just let the memories wash over me. It came first as wisps and then ever increasing clarity and in color and tone. I tried to grab each one before it slipped away. I am no preacher, but I do have some memories that I'll share with you today. In the late 1940s, just after World War II, my dad had come home from the war after four years and Friday nights were pretty special because all of the people that had deployed with him from the Atlantic Coastline Railroad, which he served, spent those four years together and returned. They met every Friday night at somebody's home. And usually when they met at our home, um, they played cribbage or they told stories that got exceedingly violent and big and bigger and bigger. My mother put up with it. She would put coffee on the table, and then she would fade away into the back room. I think she had heard the stories a number of years. The smoke was thick because most of them were cigar smokers at the day. And their stories were about wonderful places like Casablanca and North Africa and Sicily and Italy and France, which is where they went in World War II. Last night in Thinking about this, I could smell the cigars and hear the chatter as if it were yesterday. My mother let me crouch, I was a little boy, my mother let me crouch on a stairway sort of in the dark and listen. When I thought these thoughts last night, I said a prayer for all of those men, some of whom did not come home. In the 1950s, I was a high school senior in North Carolina. I had not a clue what I was going to do about college. I wasn't a great student, and so my options were somewhat limited. But a bunch of my buddies were going to the Citadel, a South Carolina military college. Some of them with scholarships, others had, uh, had been accepted there, and they were going to the Citadel for a weekend to sort of see what it looked like. 
And they said, come on, go with us. Well, I had no interest in it, whatever, but I had more interest in doing something over that weekend. So we, we jumped into a 1959 Chevrolet, big fins, all of that. And we headed out to South Carolina. Well, we found on the way that tragically three musicians had died that weekend in an airplane crash. Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper. That won't mean a thing to half of the folks here today, but for about four hours we listened to Peggy Sue, La Bamba, Chantilly Lace, and they still rumble around in my head, not because I love the music, just because I remember that weekend. We got to Charleston with about 10 minutes to spare before the Friday afternoon retreat parade. I was a last minute add to the trip. I didn't have any allegiance to the military, didn't think I possibly would uh, be interested at all in what went on that weekend, but at precisely 4 o'clock, 1600, a tall ramrod straight man dressed in a gray woolen jacket with a maroon sash, carrying a gleaming sword, he stalked out to the corner of the parade ground, came to a precise halt and bellowed sound adjutant's call. It was like he had turned a light switch because 2,000 young men in, set, in the same uniform, in perfect step, began to emerge from the sally ports onto the parade ground. Bugles blew, drums beat fiercely, flags flailed in the air, and something happened to me that day over a half a century ago. It was a swirl of guns and drums and uniforms and flags and gleaming brass and all sorts of uh, things that caused an instant love affair with the military with me that afternoon. And after all the years of service, those intangibles to me in that garage holding my old rucksack were just as bright and vibrant as if it were yesterday. So, join the Army. By the way, this blouse is wool. It uh, weighs about 28 ounces. I feel like I'm getting a workout standing up here. Right? <laughs> I joined the Army, went to Vietnam, combat for the first time. It's a horrible thing, it's a tragic thing, and all of those who have lived it in some way will agree that even if it is tragic and horrible, you probably never felt quite as alive and full of adrenaline as you did in that situation. In my garage, I could smell the jungle, I could feel the burning heat of the deserts, and these are things that can be recalled without much effort. These are the things veterans feel the sound of a round buzzing past your head, it's unforgettable. Hunger, thirst, fatigue, all of those things are part of the combat soldier's life, his soul. They're no longer irritants or challenges, they just are. The time comes to every fighter, regardless of the service, when death sits down beside you for a while. As a young combat company commander, I remember standing on a road in back country of Vietnam, looking down the road and seeing my scout platoon come toward me in an armored personnel carrier. A huge explosion. Noise shook the ground rather than hearing it. The, character, uh, the carrier went up and displayed and broke into pieces and the pieces rained down. Uh, it fell back to earth in a crater that was left by the mine. I can still feel the adrenaline as I ran toward it. There were odors, screams, moaning. I could feel the driver's blood as I held him while he died. I remember the salty tears afterward that day and again in my garage, fresh and no less real. One of my favorite memories, and that's what veterans do, remember. 
As a young colonel, I was serving in one of our Army's oldest divisions, the 1st Infantry Division. Once a year, their veterans gathered at Fort Riley, Kansas, and had a memorial in the cemetery there. Generally, a veteran of the division spoke, and it was a wonderful, meaningful service. The last thing that was to happen this day was to put a wreath at the monument in the center, and we fortunately had a four-star general named Bill DePew, who was to do that. He was a man practiced and never failed to prepare for something. I got there a little early since I was in, in charge of it. And he was the only one there. He was walking around this monolith in the cemetery, talking to himself, taking six steps, six steps, six steps to get around it. I watched for a while with interest, always listened and watched what he did. He was of that sort. It wasn't a surprise to me that he was there rehearsing. So about 10 minutes into it, a limousine pulled up at the entryway. Two people got out. One was clearly a nurse. I remember her in hospital whites. And the other was an elderly gentleman. I later found was 99 years old. He was dressed in a World War I uniform, puttees, leggings, flat hat, and he had sergeant stripes, big red things, upside down. And he was pulling a little oxygen bottle behind him on a dolly, held on to the nurse with one hand, oxygen in the other, and they walked down about 50 paces to where the general was rehearsing. And it was obvious that they didn't know he was a general. And it didn't matter to him, the old soldier, whether he was or not. He was a sergeant, you see. He let go of the oxygen bottle, and he came up closer, and he sort of invaded the general's space. And then with a very frail hand, he saluted the general. And he said, sir, I'm the last sergeant alive in my regiment. I won't be here next year and you must take after the boys today. I never was quite certain whether he knew what he was saying or whether he was all there, but General DePew turned to him and he got it just right. He simply said, Sergeant, you are relieved of duty. Well done. It will be my honor to replace you. I'll never forget it. In the last several years, the obituary section of the paper has gotten more familiar to me than the sports, somehow. Used to watch the Nationals. <laughs> I, I look for them on the obituary section. <laughs> a few years ago, I served as a pallbearer for a giant in our Army. His name was Maxwell Reed Taylor. He invented the modern volunteer army, in my judgment. It was a beautiful funeral service. We all crammed into the chapel at Fort Myer. After the service, we formed in a rank of veterans, and we followed the horse-drawn caisson and the riderless horse to his gravesite. It was a clear day, a bitter day, bitter cold. Horse's breath was steamy and, and swirling. Flag snapped in a, in a wind. So we marched from the chapel to the gravesite. And as we did, we passed a group of young officers. They were in uniform and standing talking to each other. They saluted the flag. And then I heard them say, He'll be, there'll never be another like him. He was a giant of a man. Well, that was pretty profound, and it was still rumbling around in my mind when we got to the gravesite. It was just below the flame. You could stand and look all the way to the Capitol, across the sea of crosses. And it struck me. Yes, he was a giant of a man, but I was standing in a sea of giants, people who had sworn to give their life if needed so that we are free as Emily said, to practice our faith here today. It's a noble calling, this business of protecting your country. So in that night in the garage, after 
fiddling around for a while trying to clean the rucksack which was stained with years of use and un uncleanable. My wife of 40, 48 years, my love, appeared at the garage door to call me to supper. What are you doing with that old, that old knapsack? I didn't stop to tell her of the nuances and the precision of what's the differences between a knapsack and a rucksack. <laughs> I wasn't sure I'd get supper if I did all that. <laughs> but I said to her, just remembering, and she said quietly, okay, old soldier, supper's ready. Being a veteran is an honorable thing. Remembering is the stuff of veterans. May God be close with all of those deployed today and those veterans who have gone before us. Amen.